Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Jason Wingreen, who died recently at the age of 95. He was one of my favorite character actors, although his most famous role is one where you don't see him, and one that I'm not particularly fond of. He was the voice of Boba Fett in all those Star Wars movies starting with The Empire Strikes Back, and I'm not a big fan of that stuff, but hey, when you're grossing billions every time around, somebody's doing something right. Here he is with James Earl Jones doing a little bit of Boba Fett. No disintegration. As you wish. You may take Captain Solo to Jabba the Hutt after I have Skywalker. He's no good to me dead. You're being put into carbon freeze. What if he doesn't survive? He's worth a lot to me. Put Captain Solo in the cargo hold. My guess is he got some good coin for that gig, and here he gives an interview about how he got it when he was asked by George Lucas's associate, producer Gary Kurtz, to audition for the role. And we recorded it. I would say seven minutes of work. Seven minutes to do it all. And then uh, it was, and I was finished. So then Gary Kurtz uh, took me by the arm and lead me to my car, which was parked just outside of the soundstage. But there was a dark room between where we were and the stage. And there was a man sitting in the dark room. Gary Kurtz led me up to where this man was sitting, and he said, uh, Jason, uh, this, is, uh, this is George Lucas. He didn't get up and shake hands. Or I said I had to, had to say something. So I said, uh, I don't believe we've ever met. And George Lucas said, no, but I know Boba Fett. That's all. <laughs> so then, so then, my, uh, then Gary Kurtz grabbed me by the arm and he, and he pulled me over to the stage door and to, my, to my car. And I stood out there and I said, well, what did he mean did he, when he said, I know Boba Fett? Does he mean I know Boba Fett and, and, and you not, you're not it? Or I know Boba Fett and you really nailed it. I think I nailed it because that's my voice on... Jason Wingring was another one of those nice Jewish boys from Brooklyn who got into acting after World War II. He was actually one of the founders of the Circle in the Square Theater Company in Greenwich Village. And then he gravitated towards television. Again, I said, mostly as a supporting actor, although he did have a recurring role in the later All in the Family series in Archie Bunker's place. But my favorite two Jason Wingring performances or where he's a supporting actor in two of my favorite episodes of television of all time. The first is in the first episode of Dobie Gillis, which is a true classic. Here he is as a movie theater proprietor running a lottery in an episode called Caper at the Bijou. Ultimately, Thalia Menninger, Tuesday Weld, and Dobie, and Maynard G. Krebs, Bob Denver, will try and fix this lottery. Well, yeah, I want you to know that no matter what happens here tonight, it's my passionate wish that this partnership should continue forever and ever. Yeah, yeah. Let me put it to you simply. I'm yours. Are you cookie? Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bijou Theater. And here we are all ready for another big jackpot. Now, have you all got your jackpot numbers? All right, folks, here we go. Now I'm going to ask someone in the front row here to draw a number. Then I'm going to wait 30 seconds to see if the lucky winner appears. And if he does not, I'll have another number drawn. All right, here we go. Sir, would you mind drawing a number, please? Sir? Uh, number, out of the basket, please, if you would. Oh, cool, Dad. And uh, what is it? Three, two, two. Three, two, two. is number three, two, two in the house. That was back in 1959, one of his first performances on television. But if you ask me, his most memorable performance, his best performance, was in one of the great episodes of Twilight Zone in the early 60s called A Stop at Willoughby. He plays a sort of creepy train conductor who talks with James Daly. We talked about James Daly when we did the Yogi Berra podcast. And at the end of the episode, he watches James Daly jump from the train. How are you tonight, Mr. Williams? In the absolute pink. Cold winter this year. Seems to get darker earlier than it ever has. Well, that's the way of the world. Rich get richer, and the days get shorter. That's right. Westport Saugatuck next stop. Westport Saugatuck. Have a good sleep, Mr. Williams? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a good sleep. Well, an idiotic dream. Idiotic. You ever hear of a town called Willoughby? Willoughby? Willoughby where? Willoughby, Connecticut, I guess, or Willoughby, New York? Not on this run. No Willoughby on the line. Westport Zogatuck next stop. Westport Zogatuck. Just 
jumped off the train, did he? Shouted something about Willoughby, and ran out to the platform, and that was the last I saw him. Doctor says he must have died instantly. They're going to take him into town for an autopsy. Funeral parlor there sent the ambulance. Willoughby, maybe it's wishful thinking nestled in a hidden part of a man's mind. Or maybe it's the last stop in the vast design of things. Or perhaps for a man like Mr. Gart Williams, who climbed on a world that went by too fast, it's a place around the bend where he could jump off. Willoughby, whatever it is, it comes with sunlight and serenity and is a part of the Twilight Zone. I'll tell you, stop at Willoughby's in the class photo for the greatest episodes of Twilight Zone ever. We're going to move on now to our feature tonight, Vilmos Zygmunt, who died recently at the age of 85. He was the great film cinematographer from Hungary. He's the second cinematographer we lost recently. We just did the podcast on Haskell Wexler. Here's a brief news announcement on Bill Mosh Zygmunt's death. The Academy Award-winning cinematographer of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, as well as films like The Deer Hunter, Deliverance, and Heaven's Gate, Bill Mosh Zygmunt passed away on Friday. He was 85. The Hungarian board Zygmunt, who filmed the Hungarian Revolution alongside his friend and fellow cinematographer Laszlo Kovacs, before they both relocated to Los Angeles began his Hollywood career as a director of photography on low-budget exploitation and horror films and TV movies before he was hired by director Robert Altman. Together, Altman and Zygmunt implemented the Western's unique use of zoom shots, a technique that wasn't frequently employed in big-screen filmmaking, as well as flashing the filmed footage to give McCabe and Mrs. Miller its old-time look. Well, as she said, his body of work was very impressive, and he won the 1978 Academy Award for Cinematography, working with Steven Spielberg in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Here's the Academy Award presentation, and Bob Hope sounds like he might be a little tipsy here. To present the next award to, com to, to two contemporary film stars, she copped an Oscar for Cactus Flower and can soon be seen in foul play. He was nominated for Midnight Cowboy, and is currently riveting audiences and coming home. Now they're both coming here. Goldie Hawn and John Voigt. We're here to present that most important award, one of the original eight awards, the award for best cinematography. And the winner is... Bill Mastigman! The Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I would like to thank you first to this country the American people who gave me a second life. I would like to thank my old masters in the Hungarian film school, Ilais George, Boyko Skibela, and Janusz Badal. Also, I would like to thank you, all of you. Sounds like a pretty nice guy. Here he is discussing his craft in an interview. What is the most important quality a cinematographer has to have? Collaboration. If you want to see, the collaboration is the most important thing that from day one, when you read the script and you meet the director, you start talking about the, the project. You have to find out what is going to be my job, how educated my director is about images. Because, you know, there are directors who are very educated, that maybe do still photography themselves. Maybe they even were shooting movies before. Many of the directors did that. So you have to find out what is going to be the director's job, what is going to be my job. And if we can come into an agreement that uh, the director is going to give me some space, I can add something to the images and not just follow directions like the directors, many, many directors want to do. I would like to be part of the image making process. I would like to decide many times, you know, what kind of a lighting I would like to use, what kind of a Part of the day we should shoot something if you are shooting on, on location, whether it's a morning scene or a noon scene or an evening scene or a dusk scene or a night scene. So I would like to make those choices with the director because, you know, we have to have an agreement about that. And then, you know, a director should let me do the lighting because many directors don't even are interested to do that. Many directors will not be able to do it either. You know, many, many directors are happy to hire us because we are the, basically the people who have the experience and the willingness and the enthusiasm to do that job, you know, to create the mood and have it set and to tell the story the best way so the audience is going to feel like they are there. 
And that's the important thing, is that all the images that we are creating for the screen, the people should feel that they are there. And that's the trick, actually, of the whole movie business, basically, that you have to tell the story to the people, even forget about that there's a camera, there's a sound man, there are actors, there are directors, producers, editors. They forget about that. And they, they can get involved to the story, but even forget that they are sitting in a theater. And the best movie, you forget that, that you are sitting in a theater. But in order to do that, I think you have to create the best possible real images so that people are there. Well, we're going to close tonight with Robert Stiglitz, who died recently at the age of 81. Robert Stiglitz was the Australian rock and film producer, and at least in my mind, he was as important to the disco craze of the 1970s as any single individual. He came from Australia to London in the 1960s. He was knocking around with all the rock guys. He helped put together Cream, teaming up Eric Clapton, Ginger Baker, and Jack Bruce. We've done the Jack Bruce podcast. Here's a fact about him you didn't hear much about. In early 1967, he signed a deal with the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein. Epstein actually made stick with a minority partner in the Beatles. And he also gave him an option to buy majority partnership, which would have given Stigwood management rights over the Beatles. Epstein died of an overdose a year later, and Stigwood tried to exercise his option to become majority partner. The Beatles were not too happy about that. They were of the opinion that Epstein had done the deal behind their backs. When Stigwood visited them when they were filming Magical Mystery Tour, Paul McCartney threatened to record God Save the Queen out of tune on every record the group made from then on if Stigwood exercised his majority option. Sensibly, Stigwood backed off, and he left to form his own enterprise, the Robert Stigwood Organization. From there, things took off for Stigwood in the 1970s, and for about a decade, he had the golden touch. 1971, he produced Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway, which basically made a household name out of Andrew Lloyd Webber. He also produced Tommy in 1975. But his most important accomplishment was hooking up with three fellow Australians, the Bee Gees. And he was the man who was responsible for producing Saturday Night Fever. For a while, he was printing money. No single movie was more instrumental in popularizing disco than that one. And almost half the number one songs in 1978 were produced by the Robert Stigwood organization. He and the Bee Gees were a great partnership there in the mid-70s, and it looked like he could do no wrong, but he overstepped his bounds a little bit. And in 1978, he produced the film version of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, starring the Bee Gees, Peter Frampton, and George Burns. And it was a huge bomb, and it marked the beginning of the end of his career. The sequel to Saturday Night Fever was junk. Disco had run its course. By the early 1980s, the Bee Gees were suing him for hundreds of millions of dollars. He was countersuing them for millions of dollars. That's your typical show business story. By the 2000s, I think he was still pretty much a very wealthy guy, one of Britain's wealthiest but he pretty much faded into obscurity. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps, And I'm going to close tonight with my favorite song from Saturday Night Fever, produced by Robert Stigwood. It was written by the Bee Gees. They performed it in the movie, and actually it was performed twice in the movie. So I'm going to play the Bee Gees version first, and then I'm going to play the version that I think is superior, but I'll let you decide. Here's the Bee Gees version of More Than a Woman. <laughs> never released that as a single. They actually wrote it for an American group of Cape Verdean heritage, like Horace Silver. We've done his podcast. The group was Tavares, an R&B funk band, and I think their version is superior. They also used it in the movie, but they couldn't use it in John Travolta's dance scenes because it was a little too fast for him to dance to. to be